Alien, Humanoid Cryptid, Man in Black, Figment of the Imagination, or all of the above. This being who terrorises people in the dead of night is known by many names, but he needs only one. Who is the Grinning Man? Cast your mind back to your childhood, a time when life was a curious mix of innocence, hijinks and promise, when each day was a new adventure, when there was no limit to your curiosity, energy or imagination, when weekends brought you pocket money, scraped knees brought you tears, and darkness, all manner of foreboding. Just as surely as most children fear the dark, most also fear some kind of bogeyman. Was there a bogeyman in your town? Perhaps it was the village recluse, who lived in a decrepit old house at the end of the street. Maybe it was something unseen, watching from beyond the tree line of the woods behind your home. Or perhaps it was some unsightly creature, dwelling on a lonely windswept moor, only venturing out during the night to feast on the blood of the young. Whatever it was, your fear of it more than likely diminished with age. There are no such things as monsters, your parents probably told you, drummed into you even, and maybe you would believe them, maybe you wouldn't, but in time, as you got older, it became an accepted and imperishable truth. And yet even now, how can we be so sure? Every year across the globe, People report seeing what they describe as monsters. Aliens, ghosts, Bigfoot, the Wendigo, skinwalkers, black-eyed children, the Chupacabra, Dogman, Mothman, Slenderman, Lizardman, Pig-faced men, Invisible men, Men in Black. The list goes on and on and on. And whilst encounters with such beings are said to be horrifying in their own right, by far and away, one of the most frightening entities you could ever bump into on a cold dark evening is said to be the Grinning Man. Not least because, unlike many of the others, he has been known to enter people's homes in the dead of night and watch them while they sleep. On the surface at least, the Grinning Man's appearance doesn't sound all too frightening. He doesn't have the large soulless black eyes of an alien grey the huge imposing girth of a Sasquatch, or the sharp teeth and claws of the Dogman, but there is something about him that disturbs eyewitnesses to their core. Said to be about seven foot tall, with broad shoulders and a muscular physique, he is described as having small beady eyes, which are set unnaturally wide apart, nestled either side of a shallow nose. His face and head are utterly devoid of hair, and he is often seen wearing a tight-fitting one-piece suit, which is reflective, like tin foil. It is said that his facial expression would otherwise be docile, but for the fact that he constantly sports a wide, inhuman grin. And it is this grin which eyewitnesses find most disturbing, for it is not a grin of pleasure or even amusement. It is one of sheer menace. It is said that his mouth smiles, but his eyes do not. And aside from this disconcerting facial expression, witnesses have also reported a feeling of absolute dread when confronted by this being, almost as if they are staring death in the face. What follows is a select few of some of the most terrifying encounters with the Grinning Man. 
The earliest recorded sighting occurred in Elizabeth, New Jersey on the 11th of October 1966. It was 9.45pm and two boys by the names of Martin Munov and James Yankaitis were walking home from a movie theatre along New Jersey and 4th Street. After a while, they turned onto another road that ran adjacent to NJ and 4th and found themselves walking beneath the elevated New Jersey Turnpike. After dark, this area of town was certainly no place for two young boys, and they must have felt uneasy as they walked through what was essentially a dark tunnel, with traffic pounding 30 feet over their heads, and only a few pools of light emanating from the street lamps on the road above. Lining their route was a high chain link fence, the other side of which was a steep slope, leading back to the underside of the turnpike. Earlier that evening, they had heard that a woman in town had been chased by a huge man wearing a green suit, but they tried to put this out of their minds as they walked through the darkness, chatting as nonchalantly as their nerves would allow. They had almost emerged from the other side of the turnpike when James noticed someone standing in the bushes on the opposite side of the chain link fence. He nudged his friend and said, Who's that? Martin turned to look behind him and that's when both boys noticed how incredibly tall and well-built this figure was. He was wearing a green reflective suit, and his attention seemed to be entirely fixed on a house across the street, situated some 200 metres away from where they were. He didn't even notice the two boys looking at him at first, but after a few seconds, he turned to face them. The boys later described him as the weirdest looking guy they had ever seen, his face didn't even look human. Needless to say, they panicked and ran, leaving the figure behind, grinning at their backs. As fate would have it, famous author and ufologist John Keel was in the area shortly after the encounter, investigating a UFO which had been witnessed 40 miles north of Elizabeth. He got wind of the boy's story and set about interviewing them separately they both gave the same description, and both indicated exactly the same spot where they had seen the strange entity. And because the aforementioned UFO sighting had occurred on the very same evening, it wouldn't be long before conclusions were drawn pertaining to the Grinning Man's otherworldly origins. The second eyewitness account was to come less than three weeks later, some 500 miles west of Elizabeth in West Virginia. Woodrow Derenberger, a sewing machine salesman, was driving along Interstate 77 on the evening of the 2nd of November when he encountered a UFO, which dropped out of the sky in front of his car and stopped him dead in the road. A tall being with wide-set eyes and a huge grin stretched across its face exited the strange craft and approached his vehicle. Unlike the New Jersey grinning man, this one was said to be wearing a blue suit, but it had the same qualities in that it was a one-piece and was made of a reflective material. To his surprise, the entity communicated with Derenberger telepathically, asking about the strange glow on the horizon, not realising that it was the lights of a distant town. Derenberger reported that the individual referred to himself as Indrid Cold, a name which didn't mean anything to him at the time, but one which would gain much notoriety in the decades that followed. Cold proceeded to ask Derenberger many questions about the people and surrounding areas, then thanked him and left in his strange craft, but not before telling the startled salesman that he would be seeing him again. This encounter occurred just two weeks before the famed Mothman sightings began in nearby Point Pleasant, and many people have often wondered whether there was any link between the two. Indeed, there was a sighting of the Grinning Man on the outskirts of Point Pleasant when the Mothman phenomenon was at its height. The Lily family had been experiencing poltergeist activity in their home around this time, which had begun abruptly for no apparent reason. All of a sudden, things were being moved around the house of their own accord. Objects were being thrown from shelves, doors were being slammed, and even lights were being seen in the sky above their house. It was a tumultuous time for the family, 
who were constantly bearing the brunt of this bizarre episode at all hours of the day and night. However, it would be the youngest daughter Linda who fared the worst, and would experience the most terrifying aspect of this strange activity. At 1.45am on December the 14th 1966, Linda came running into her parents' bedroom, screaming in terror. She told her mother and father that she had been awoken by an odd clicking sound, and when she opened her eyes, she was horrified to see a figure standing at the foot of her bed. It was a man, she said. A big man. Very tall. I couldn't see his face very well, but I could see that he was grinning at me. He walked around the bed and stood right over me. I screamed again and hid under the covers. When I looked again, he was gone. Suffice to say that Linda refused to sleep in her own room for weeks afterwards, and by the time she did pluck up the courage to climb back into her own bed, the poltergeist activity in the home had abated, and the Lily family never experienced anything out of the ordinary from that point onwards. From late 1966 to early 1967, a number of people in Provincetown, Massachusetts would have separate run-ins with a neighbourhood prowler, whom they described as very tall, muscular, and always wearing a fixed grin. The details of these reports do exist in old clippings from local newspapers, but unfortunately, they are yet to be published online. We must point out that not all Grinning Man sightings have occurred in the US. A young woman living in Scotland by the name of Mary Elizabeth McRae would have an extremely chilling encounter, which would trouble her for many years afterwards. Mary lived with her husband Alan on the outskirts of Dunkeld, a small village situated right on the cusp of the stunning Cairngorms National Park. The couple were in their mid-fifties, and their children had long since left home, so for the most part, it was just Mary and Alan living together in peaceful isolation. Their house was remote, the closest neighbour lived almost a mile away, but they enjoyed the relative privacy. On the night of the 23rd of November 1972, Mary and Alan went to bed at around 9pm, as was usual for them, and they sat up reading for about an hour before turning off the lights and going to sleep. Mary reported that she was awoken in the early hours of the morning by an indistinct clicking sound, and upon opening her eyes, she found herself lying on her front, completely paralysed and struggling to breathe. Sleep paralysis was not fully understood or even identified as a disorder during the 1970s, so Mary, who had never experienced anything like this before, felt an inward and intensifying panic, but was unable to do anything about her situation. The clicking increased in volume, piercing her eardrums, and then something suddenly dawned on her. She remembered that she had closed the curtains before getting into bed, it was something she always did every night without fail, and yet now she could see that they were open. All this time, she had a distinct feeling of being watched, and a very slight movement in the periphery of her vision drew her attention to the bottom left pane of the bedroom window. To her complete horror, she saw a face staring back at her. It had dark beady eyes and was fixed with an awful, malevolent grin. As she stared back, she felt herself becoming transfixed, unable to avert her gaze. She then felt her whole body lift off the bed, and slowly float towards the face. In her panic, she tried to scream out, but no sound came from her mouth, and she was unable to move. She was not to know what happened next, as she blacked out, and when she awoke the next morning, she was suffering from a terrible headache, which did not ease for almost a week afterwards. She also noticed that the curtains were still open, a fact which cast doubt on any notion in later years that she had simply experienced a bout of sleep paralysis. Mary passed away in 2013 at the age of 94, but the memory of what she saw that night stayed with her until the day she died. Taking all of these accounts into consideration, what are we to make of this phenomenon? Just who on earth is the grinning man? Or rather, what is he? 
is there more than one of him? Or is he a single entity who chooses to terrorise unsuspecting individuals for no apparent reason? There are a number of conflicting accounts regarding his identity, and whilst all eyewitnesses describe him in a similar fashion, the situations in which he has been seen vary significantly. For example, some people who have encountered the famed men in black have described them as having inhuman features, as well as sporting malevolent grins. Others who claim to have been abducted by aliens have also reported seeing a grinning man during their experience. Indeed, the clicking sounds heard in both the Linda Lilly and Mary McRae encounters are commonly reported in many alien abduction cases, and some abductees have even mentioned the name of Indrid Cold, the name stated to Woodrow Derenberger during his experience. One such encounter occurred in Italy in December of 1979, when a man by the name of Pierre Zanfretta, who allegedly had a history of being abducted by a race of reptilian aliens, claimed to have been contacted by a grinning man shortly before being taken aboard a UFO. He said that this man referred to himself as none other than Indrid Cold. Throughout the late 60s and early 70s, Woodrow Derenberger would go on to state that he was visited many more times by the same Indrid Cold he had met on that cold dark night back in 1966. He would also claim to have been visited by two other grinning men who went by the names of Demo Hassan and Carl Ardo. Even his wife testified to meeting these beings, and she believed their agenda was evil. Sadly, she and Derenberger divorced shortly after these encounters. Finally, there is the connection with the Mothman, which many people believe was itself an extraterrestrial being. Some fringe theorists have even presented a theory that the Grinning Man Indrid Cold and the Mothman were all one and the same, a member of the same race of shape-shifting aliens, who in fact walk among us and even pose as government officials in the form of MIBs. But is this perhaps a stretch too far? After all, if we are to look at these accounts with a critical eye, we must point out that at least the first three reported sightings of the Grinning Man begin and end with John Keel. He was the first to write about them in his books, and would have applied his own biases and taken his own artistic liberties. Even the Mothman sightings were further borne out and brought to international attention by him. Perhaps these encounters were embellished and made out to be more bizarre than they actually were, and it would therefore be reasonable to assume that any eyewitness accounts since then are purely copycat fabrications. Of course, this is all speculation and it is rather uncanny how all physical descriptions of this being are inherently similar, and interesting how these sightings always seem to occur around the same time of year, between winter and spring. Could it be that the grinning man, whomever he is, seems to prefer colder seasons? No pun intended, of course, on his alleged last name. The fact remains that whether we believe it or not, the Grinning Man phenomenon is here to stay, with more and more encounters being reported with each passing year. And if you ever find yourself walking alone at night, or even sleeping soundly in your own bed, pray you never come face to face with a tall man who wears a fixed grin and who calls himself Cold.